Today we're going to discuss exercise 204, which is the next in our series of exercises and lectures for digital tools for architects. Today we're going to concentrate on V-Ray. Uh, the last couple days we've been uh, part, really concentrating on Rhino uh, and learning to work in Rhino, but I think it works best to interweave some V-Ray with our Rhino. So we work for a few days in Rhino, then we take a day and work on V-Ray. And then we go back and work for a few more days in Rhino, and then we come back and work in V-Ray. Uh, so today we're going to work in V-Ray, and this is going to serve as an introduction to um, V-Ray for you guys. I know in the first exercise you did do a little bit of V-Ray work, but I think this is really meant to be more of a comprehensive look at uh, the basics of V-Ray. So we're going to get started with exercise 204 in just a second, but before we do that, I want to remind you that once you've logged into your uh, VMware Horizon client, which is right here, I've logged into the DVC computers as well, first thing to do is to make sure that you're connected to your OneDrive account. So down here in the lower right corner by the clock, you should see a cloud icon. Uh, for me, it's blue because I'm already connected to OneDrive. Uh, for you guys, it may be gray. Make sure that you actually do connect to your OneDrive. There it is. And I'm going to go ahead and open up Rhino 7. So with Rhino 7, once this splash screen shows up here, I'm going to choose the large object inches template. And I'll get a fresh, brand new drawing that is uh, already in inches as my units. I can check down here in the left corner and make sure it says inches, which it does. Uh, I've also taken some time to customize my um, Rhino and or its toolbars. Um, for you guys, when you first log in, you'll see a bunch of V-Ray toolbars. The only one you need is this V-Ray All toolbar. The rest of them you can go ahead and close. And I take this toolbar and I drag it up to the top here and I dock it right below my command line. So it just sits right up there. For what we're going to be doing today, we're going to be working primarily in the perspective view. So I'm going to go ahead and double click on the perspective view here. And when I do that, I'll get a large perspective view. And from here, we can go ahead and get started with our exercise 204. So right here, the first part in part one is to create a simple composition of five objects. Now I don't really care what the objects are, but for our purposes, I'm going to go ahead and click on this box icon right there. And that's going to create our, our first shape, which is a box. So we'll start there and I'm going to say at four feet comma four feet and I'll hit enter and then we'll make it four feet tall. That just gives us kind of a basic size to work with. So there's my first object. We'll come over here and let's create a different shape. Let's create, oh, I don't know. Uh, let's do a, let's do a cylinder. So we'll come over here and we'll create a cylinder, make it a little bit taller, maybe like that. Now, it's kind of hard to see these objects because we're just seeing the outlines of the objects. If we want to see them in kind of a temporary shaded mode, we can switch from our wireframe mode into our shaded mode. So I access that by clicking on this little downward facing triangle next to the word perspective, and I can switch from wireframe into shaded. Now these two objects right now intersect. I'm going to move them just a little bit. I'll type move, and we'll go over just a little bit. I could also go up to my transform tool and then select move from there. I'm used to typing, so I have a tendency to jump to that direction, but they're available there as well. So I have my second shape. Let's go ahead and create a third shape. Uh, I don't know, let's do a pyramid. So we'll drop a pyramid in the back here. About like that. There it is. Let's do a sphere. I'm going to put the sphere right, right there. Now that's intersecting again. The other problem with the sphere, and this is where I want using the front view or the right side view, you can see that it's actually lower than our ground plane. So we would need to move that up. So I can type move or I could just drag it. But then I also don't want it intersecting with other objects so I can move it over just a little bit here. And I'm just dragging that for right now, but I could easily uh, use the move command there as well. 
Let's jump back into the perspective view. Let's do one more object here. Oops, wrong, wrong one there. Uh, let's come over here to the tube. And we'll put this one in front just a little bit. And we'll come up right about there. Oh, looks like they're intersecting. So same thing, let me type move. And we'll move this forward a bit so that they're not intersecting like that. So uh, it looks like maybe that's intersecting right there. Let's move that one over just a bit too. There we go. So I'm going to create a view that looks pretty good. I'm going to jump it more, a little bit more into perspective view. Uh, and I want to make sure that I zoom in on this just a bit. Maybe about like that. Now if I were to do a rendering right now, just to see what it would look like, I could click, come up here to my V-Ray tools, and I could come to this little teapot icon right here, and I could start a rendering. This will open the V-Ray frame buffer. Oops, looks like it didn't. Ah, it says I need to um, choose my renderer. Looks like it might have defaulted into to V-Ray. Let me show you where that choice would be. If I go to render, and I go to current renderer and I choose V-Ray for Rhino. Rhino, that's what I'm after. And let's go ahead and let's do that rendering again. There we go, it's gonna go pretty fast. We can see my overall composition. I have each of my shapes, they're all white because they have a default material on them and they're on kind of a mottled gray background. So I don't need to save this right now, I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of a preview of what we were rendering. There we go. So let's continue on with our uh, exercise 204. So we've created a simple composition of five objects. Next thing to do is to go through some basic V-Ray options. And so we'll open what is called my V-Ray Asset Editor. That's this sphere here with kind of a V superimposed on it. There we go. And this V-Ray Asset Editor window is really the catch-all um, for V-Ray and V-Ray's options. So what we'll concentrate on first, we're gonna ignore all of these buttons and we're gonna go straight to the gear icon right here, which is the V-Ray settings. So we'll click on settings and this gives us some basic settings. Now it's important to point out that in this V-Ray asset editor, there are always drawers out to the right and out to the left that give us additional capabilities within V-Ray, but they try to consolidate it down so you're not overwhelmed with too many options. So let's look first at our basic render options. First thing is our rendering engine. We're gonna be using the CPU. We can switch over uh, to using the graphics card, though I find on the DVC machines um, that they don't work as well, especially over the remote desktop. So we're gonna leave it with the CPU. We're gonna leave interactive turned off. This is an option where you can have interactive rendering as you're working in Rhino. It really only works with simple scenes. If you start to get anything too complex, it bogs the computer down quite a bit. So we're gonna leave that off for right now. The next thing we're gonna do, uh, progressive, we're gonna leave checked on. And then under quality here, it's set to medium right now. We can leave it at medium for our purposes today, but recognize that if you were doing a final rendering, um, you would wanna bump that quality up uh, a bit from medium. So we'll come down here to the next drawer, which is camera. This is how the V-Ray interprets the scene that it's seeing and how it processes uh, its information. I'm not gonna worry about anything in camera just yet, so we'll go ahead and, and make that a little bit smaller. And we'll go to render output. Now this one is important. So what render output does is it controls what we're actually rendering. So the aspect ratio right now is a 16 by nine or a widescreen aspect ratio. What I like to do is instead of doing a 16 by nine, I actually like to match the viewport. And if I click on match viewport, it's going to match exactly what I see here. So what I'm seeing on my screen is what's going to render. Now I can also change the width and height. So let's say that I wanted um, you know, this to be 1080. I could type in 1080. And when I hit the tab key or when I move to the other, uh, the height, uh, excuse me, the width, it will automatically adjust based on that aspect ratio. So there it is, and it matches. So for, for my purposes right now, uh, we can leave it a little bit smaller. So we'll go back to 450, because the quality of the rendering doesn't matter too much for what we're doing. There is also an option to automatically save the image when it's done rendering. I'm not gonna do that right now, but sometimes toward the end of the semester, it's nice to do that uh, just in case. So next up, 
um, we can close the render output. We have a few other options. Animation we'll skip over for right now. Environment, if we were to expand that, we can see that we have a background. That's that model gray background. It's represented by this, um, this texture pattern. Um, and we have, we have GI turned on uh, and we have kind of a, a basic value here. We're not overriding any of the materials and we're not dealing with the V-Ray swarm just yet. There are other options out to the right here. Uh, they have to do with some of our, our little sub options. We do want to make sure that our global illumination is turned on. That's important, which it is by default. There are lots more very specific pieces of information. For example, a volumetric environment is like rendering fog. We can do that, uh, but that's another topic for another day. So I just like to point out where all of those options are. So now that we've gone through our basic options, we can move on into our next piece of exercise 204. The next piece here is to add a V-Ray infinite plane. So as I said, when we did our basic rendering, this was on kind of a gray background. It didn't really have a piece of ground to it. If we want there to be a piece of ground, we can use a special tool that's available to us from V-Ray. It's called the V-Ray Infinite Plane. It's the right here. It's kind of a, uh, a, a plane or a square that's in perspective with an infinity symbol on it. Uh, that V-Ray Infinite Plane, if we click on the button, we could also type in Viz Infinite Plane, and that would show up as well. It's an infinite plane that goes off to basically to the horizon line in all directions. So that really gives us a ground. If I were to go back and render now, instead of seeing that gray background that we just saw, I'd have a white floor. Now this is hard because I can't really see anything just yet because everything is white. And we can see a little bit of shadowing, uh, but that's it. So it's time to go ahead and do a few other things to get ready for the render. The next piece in exercise 204 is to add a basic directional light. And of course, all of these are links that we can click through and they'll walk you through how to create each of these options. So there's the V-Ray infinite plane. It'll walk through how that command works. The basic options here, it'll walk through those basic options that I talked to you about just now. So let's go ahead and do the basic directional light. For me, I would prefer to use a cheater object when I create that, that basic directional light. So I'm going to click on the box corner to corner and I'm going to create a temporary box here. Do something about like that. And I'm going to use that to create my directional light. Now when I come up here to the V-Ray toolbar and I choose the directional light tool, it's right here, it's some, some three arrows pointing to the lower right corner. I'm going to start by placing the end of the direction light vector. So I'll place the end right down here. And then it says start of direction light vector. Now the nice thing about this basic directional light is that all of the light is coming from the, in this scenario, the upper left and is going down to the lower right because that's how I have it set up. It's as if I have an infinite plane of light beams coming down and hitting the objects. So there's no uh, the spotlighting effect. It's just uniform light coming in that general direction. After I've created that directional light, I'll go ahead and delete that cube that helped me set it up. So now I have this light there as well. When we move on here, the last piece of this part one is to establish a saved or named view of my objects. So there's a distinct advantage to this, and this is a lot like creating a scene if you've worked in SketchUp before. We're going to do the same thing here. So I'll click the downward facing arrow up by where it says perspective. And I'll come down into my set view, and I'm going to go to named views. So you can see here that there are a lot of views that are already established, including perspective, front, back, right, bottom, top, etc. But I'm going to go all the way down to where it says named views. And this brings up the named views dialog box right here. And from there, I can click the little disk icon to choose to save this particular view. So when I click that, by default, it's called perspective. Let's call it render one. So there it is as render one. I'll say OK. And you'll see that where it used to say perspective, it now says render one. So that's excellent. So I can close the named views dialog box here 
And just like in SketchUp when you save the scene, I can now move my objects around, I can orbit, etc. And I can always come back to that render one view by clicking the downward triangle, choosing set view, and then choosing render one. And it'll jump me back to that basic rendering. Okay, so now that we have that established, it's time to go ahead and start assigning some very basic materials. So we can open up the V-Ray Asset Editor right there. And instead of working with our settings like we did last time, we're going to work over here with some of our various assets. So if I were to click on materials here, I don't currently have any materials, but I can create a new generic material. Now some of you remember that you could use some of the presets by clicking out the library to the left and then downloading the standard V-Ray material library. Uh, for our purposes today, we're not going to get that to that until a little bit later. We want to create some materials from scratch to learn more about how materials work. So I have that newly created generic material right there. If I open the drawer to the right, we'll see a preview of that newly created material that's kind of a generic gray. Let's rename this material to be red. So let me select it and we'll call it red. And if this is a red material, we really should update the color to be red as well. So the color is currently gray. If we come down here to diffuse, that represents the color of the material. So right now the color is set to gray. Let's change that color by clicking on it and let's change it to be red. So there it is as red. And now it would be nice to assign that material to one of my objects. So if I were to select, say, this cylinder, I could apply this material by right-clicking the material name and saying apply to selection. Now a lot of you noticed that when I did that, nothing happened. And so this is one of the weird things about working in Rhino and V-Ray is that our standard shaded view doesn't show materials. So if we wanted to see the materials, we can click the downward facing arrow and instead of showing shaded, we can switch over into rendered. And this will show us a preview of the rendered materials. So there it is showing up as red. It's not perfect, but it gives us an example of what we're seeing. So let's leave that as our rendered and let's create a few more materials. I'm going to use my V-Ray Asset Editor again. I'm going to use my materials. I'm going to right click to go to the creation menu and I'll choose generic again. And let's rename this material to be, oh, I don't know, how about blue? Now, this currently is gray, so let's come down to our diffuse color and let's go into the blues and let's pick a blue and let's assign that to say this shape. So we'll right click on blue and we'll say apply material to selection. There it is. So let's create another material. So right click on our materials, generic. You can see that I'm repeating myself now. We'll rename this one, oh I don't know, how about orange? And let's change the diffuse color of this material to be orange. There we go. We'll select that pyramid in the black. We'll right click on orange and say apply to selection. Excellent. Let's create another basic color here. So once again, I'll right click on my materials. I'll choose generic. And this time let's choose green. And let's change to a nice green there. And let's go ahead and right click. Oops, sorry, we need to select an object first. And let's apply to that object there. And we have one more material to create. So let's right click and create a new generic material. And let's call this one pink. And let's come down here to pink. There we go. And we'll assign it to the sphere. We'll right click and we'll say apply to selection. So now I have basic colors 
or basic material materials that are the basic colors. And I can go ahead and perform a rendering and take a look at what it looks like. So let's click the teapot icon, which will open the V-Ray frame buffer, and we can see the rendering start. So we can see that the shadows are starting to, to appear. We have a shadow on the inside of this uh, tube or pipe. We have a shadow on this face. We have a little bit of a shadow back here being cast onto the, the pyramid, but it seems a little bit overexposed. Um, so it's just a little bit too bright. So this is acceptable, but I'd like to make that correction. Now, this is something that's certainly more advanced. So if you don't get to it or it doesn't make sense, you don't have to do it right now, but I think it would help to, uh, to make that correction for you to be able to see it. So I'm gonna open back up my V-Ray Asset Editor. I'm gonna to go to Settings, and I'm gonna come down to my camera. And we touched on this a little bit earlier. What I care about here is something called exposure value. Now, if you took my 135 class, we talked about exposure value in the photography section of the course. But for our purposes right now, what you need to know is that if I make this exposure value higher, the image will become a little bit darker. So let's bump that one up to say maybe 12. And then let's render this again. So I'll click on the teapot icon to render again. And now we're really starting to see some shadow on the floor. Uh, and this is looking much better. So we'll let that render out just a little bit more. And there it is. Now, at this point, I need to go ahead and I need to save this image because this is the first image that I'm working with. So let me click on my save icon right here. And this will allow me to save the current channel. Now, I don't want to save it into the, the system. I want to go to my OneDrive and save it into today's exercise folder. So let me go, for me, it's in my live demonstrations folder here. And let me go into 204. And let's go into the fall of 2021 and let's save it there. So this would be, let's say, exercise 204-1. Now I'm also going to choose to have it a JPEG instead of a PNG file. And I already have a sample file here, so I'm gonna go ahead and overwrite that. So this is exercise 204-1, I'll click save, and that saves this rendering for me. So that's our first rendering. Now let's add some transparency to some of these objects. So I'm gonna pick the blue cube. Now the nice thing here is that I don't actually have to select the object because it has a material applied to it. I'm editing the material and that material, whatever object it's on, will then inherit the new material properties. So let me go ahead and go up to my materials here. Let me go to blue. And actually so that I don't confuse anybody, I'm gonna hit escape to make sure that nothing's selected. I'll come over here to blue, and I'm gonna look to create some transparency. Now, it's not listed as transparency on my blue material. So if we click on blue, we come over here, we see the preview. We have diffuse, that's our color. We'll skip over reflection and refraction, and we're gonna come down here to opacity. And so this opacity value is the transparency. So it's set up, on a scale from zero to one, one being fully opaque, zero being fully transparent, and there's a slider that can help us pick how transparent we want it to be. We can also actually just type in a value. So 0.75, for example, would be 75% transparent. So I've made that change. Let me come here to my green object. Actually, let's do the pink object. And let's change that one, we'll go to opacity here, to be much less. So let's say maybe 40%. We can see that live preview of, of our object here. And now if we go back and render, we'll see that transparency. But a good question would be, why am I not seeing it in the rendered view right here, my preview? Well, that's because the rendered view is not a true rendering, it's just a example uh, or kind of a, a guide 
for us about rendering. So things like transparency aren't going to be showing here, but they're going to show in our final rendering. So let's go ahead and let's render that out. I'll click the teapot icon, which will open the, the frame buffer. And we'll let it render. And we can see that we're seeing the blue fairly well. The pink is probably a little bit too transparent. It's pretty hard to see. So let's stop this and let's edit that transparency just a bit. Let's come back here and instead of being 40, let's go up to maybe 60% transparent. And let's go 50. So we'll go to 0.5. And let's go ahead and render that one more time. So we'll let it run through its passes. Now, if we adjusted that exposure value on the camera, we might see a little bit more of this sphere here. That's the other option is we can, we can adjust that. But I'm going to let this go ahead and render through first. And this is one of those times where you'll see that every time we add something to the materials that adds to the complexity of them, it gets harder and more uh, time is taken in the rendering process. Almost done. All right, so let's go ahead and save that one as our next rendering. So I'll click on the save icon. We're going to save the current channel. We're going to change this to be a JPEG, and this is going to be exercise 204-2, and we'll go ahead and save that as well. Yes, I want to replace it there. All right. So as I said, I'm going to make a quick tweak to the overall uh, exposure value. So I'll come in here to my camera. Let's bump it up to maybe 14, and on the next rendering, we'll see a difference there as well. So right now, we've gone ahead and we've created some basic materials. And we've also assigned some transparency to those materials. As we move forward, oh, it looks like I lost my um, digital tools website here. Let me pull that back up. Oops, it helps if you get the correct class, doesn't it? All right, so we're going to move on, and at this point, we're going to adjust the trans. Or excuse me, we're going to adjust the reflection of these objects. So I have I have a tutorial here on uh, reflection options. Uh, somehow it logged me out, so bear with me for just a second while I log myself back in. Apologize for that. All right, there we go. So we're going to work on our reflection layers. There we go. So let's jump back over into Rhino. There we are. And let's pick some objects for reflection. So let's do the red material. So let's click on red. And again, over here in our materials, we're going to expand where it says reflection. And so we need to turn on the reflection so that it starts to work. And we're going to do that by increasing this reflection color. So let's go about halfway. And when that happens, we can see that it's starting to reflect the background. And we could go all the way up. We could go a little bit less. And that's going to control, oh, excuse me, that's the, um, 
that's not correct. There's my reflection color. Sorry, wrong slider. We can choose how shiny that object is and how much of the reflection we're seeing right there. We also have a reflection IOR value that we can choose to turn on. And this is a known value for certain materials. So depending on what our uh, material, the material we're trying to create would be, we can change this value to be more or less reflective. So 1.6 is kind of a generic value. If we want to go up to a diamond, I think that's about 2.4, for example, and it's going to get shinier. If we wanted to go up to, say, like a chrome, that would be a, like an 8, and it's going to get really, really shiny. So that value is going to allow us to adjust um, our, our shininess, so to speak. Um, if you wanted to know a specific reflection value, we can see that. Here we go. There's a list of IOR values for various materials. I have a link to it here. There it is. And we could actually look at a specific material. So if we were looking for, um, I don't know, something specific. Let's see. The value of mercury. It would be 1.62. Uh, if you were looking for the IOR of quartz. There it is, 1.54. Anyway, you get the idea. So you can actually look things up through this chart to see what uh, the, re the reflective IOR value would be. So that's, again, that's a link on the course website. For our purposes right now, we're just actually playing around with things. So let's change that back down, let's say like to 2. So it's a little bit shiny. Let's change one of the other materials. Let's go to the blue material. Remember, this one already had some transparency on it there in opacity. Let's turn on the reflection. Let's turn on that IOR. Let's turn our color up. There we go for our reflection color. And let's make this one um, 2.4. There we go, so it's a little bit shinier. And let's do it with the pink as well. So let's do this one, let's turn on our reflection, and let's see here, let's turn on our reflection IOR, and let's make that uh, three. And let's turn that value up there as well. Okay, so we now have those materials adjusted. Let's go back and render again. So let me click that teapot icon. And you'll see that the renderings start to take more time because there's reflections between and among these various materials. So I'm going to let that keep rendering for a second. We'll pull back up our exercise 204. There it is. And so we've added reflection layers and we've adjusted the, the Fresnel IOR, which is perfect. So at the next piece here, we wanna start working through other materials and assigning those to your images. So it looks like my rendering's almost done. As soon as that's done, we'll save it and then we'll apply some other materials to our work. While that's going on and it's rendering, oh, it just finished. So let me go ahead and save that one now. And you can see that you can really see the pink sphere much better with that reflection on it. So let's go ahead and save the current channel. Once again, I'm going to save this as a JPEG image. The reason I'm saving these as JPEG images is because it gives us a background. The PNG will make the background transparent. In the case of a JPEG, it'll save the white background. So let's go ahead and save that. Perfect. So there's my next one. So at this point, I've added my reflections, I've worked through transparencies, but sometimes you want to actually go ahead and apply a pre-existing material. So we have a couple ways of doing that. I'm going to come back to my V-Ray Asset Editor here. If we go and expand out to the left, we can download the standard V-Ray Material Library. And the nice thing is that there's actually a very good 
material library built into V-Ray. We'll let that download. You can also download specific materials from our course website or from the internet and bring those in as well. So if you come back to the course website here, I'm going to go ahead and come down here to our V-Ray materials library. And I'm going to open that in a new tab so I can leave my exercise 204 open. And this is a whole variety of materials that have been created by students in the past. And you can pick through and use those. The ones with the digital tools logo on them are ones that I've gone through and tweaked so I know that they work. The ones without the logos are the ones that students have worked with um, and they may or may not work as well. So if I wanted to download one of those, I could. So let me click on this concrete dark material right here, for example. And let me download this zip file. There it is. And hopefully that'll be the current uh, Just seeing if there's any other ones to download right now. No, nope, that'll work. Let me go ahead and minimize this so I can load those other materials as well. So let's go ahead and let's let this finish its work here. And there they are. So all of these are built in to the V-Ray Asset Editor now that I've downloaded them. And I can apply them the same way that I've applied my basic color materials. So I could take, say, this, this pyramid in the back, and I could say, you know what, I want to apply concrete to it. So let me come over here and let me apply the simple concrete to it, and I'll apply to the selection. And now that simple concrete has been applied, we can see a little preview of it. And we could also render it out. I could also take, say, this cylinder. Actually, let's do the green one in front. I could go to metal and I could apply an anodized bronze to it. Let's apply to the selection. And as I said, you can also load materials. So if we come down here at the bottom, there's a button right here that looks like a folder that says import asset file. If I were to click on that, I could then go and find one of the materials that I downloaded. So let's see if the one that I downloaded, oh, I haven't, I haven't extracted it yet. I happen to have some already on my flash drive in my resources folder. Uh, I keep a resources folder with a bunch of V-Ray materials in it. And so let's see here. There's my basic concrete uh, and I could apply that one and load it in. So there's a concrete basic, which is right here, and I could actually uh, apply that to one of these other materials like that. So let me take this blue, well, I don't really, I hate to do it to the blue because that has the transparency. Well, let's just leave it. But the point is that's how you would load it and then you'd right click on it to apply it to a particular object. So let's go ahead and let's render that out. Let me click on the little teapot icon here and we'll render it. And you can see these new materials have been applied. Now some of the materials that you can load that have a strong pattern to them, so for example if I went into bricks and I picked one of the bricks, it may not look right on your object because we haven't actually worked through adjusting how the texture is applied. That's something called texture mapping and it's something we'll come back to I believe in exercise 207. So don't worry if it doesn't quite look right from a scale standpoint or how it's applied. Uh, we just want to go through and try applying some various materials. I would stick to materials that don't really have a pattern like metal or, or leather for example, plastic, um, ceramic and porcelain, those would work. Uh, all of those would be pretty good. It looks like there's a wall paint and wallpaper, you'd probably be okay with that. Uh, the wood may have, may have enough texture to, to kind of cause some problems. So at this point, let me come back and check my rendering. There we go. I have concrete applied. I have that bronze applied. Uh, it's at past 48, so it's almost there. Let me go back and review our exercise 204 while I'm letting this finish out here. Perfect. 
We've gone through importing materials. We're gonna go ahead and, oh, the last thing, we're gonna open our 3DM file from last class and try applying some materials to that one as well. So let's go ahead and let's save this because this is done. We'll click on the save icon and this is going to be a JPEG and we'll call it 204-4. There it is. I'll leave this one open, but let me go ahead and open up my file from last class. So I'll go to file and then open. Yes, let's go ahead and save this one. Let's make sure it goes to my OneDrive so it syncs here. And let me go into today's folder. And there we go. This is exercise 204. Oops, not 304, 204. And we'll save that. And let's go back to file and then open. And I'm gonna go back to last class. Let me go to my live demonstrations. Oops, that's not the one that's been updated, sorry. Open. All right, there we go. There's my file from uh, exercise 203. And I would go ahead and I would apply the materials to this object as well. So let's take my objects and we can find a particular material. So let's go into the wall paint and wall color. Oh my, that green is awful. Uh, let, let's apply, let's try this one. Um, I'll right click and I'll say apply material to selection. Let me go ahead and select some of the other walls here. And let me apply material to selection. And I have to do the same setup that we did before. So I'm going to add that V-Ray infinite plane. I'm going to use a little box to help me create the directional light. I'll come up here to the directional light and I want to snap to that corner and then that corner. That gives me the basic directional light coming down on the object. That's good. I'll get my view set. Looks pretty good. Like that. Uh, now, I may need to adjust, so let me come back to the asset editor, let me go into settings, and let me adjust that exposure value. Ah, it looks pretty good. Um, must have adjusted it before. Let's go ahead and render that out and see how it turns out. Yeah, looks like it's working. So, there's a few pieces that I forgot, so I can go in and I can click those uh, and apply that material to them. When I'm done with this, I'll go ahead and save it as well. So this is again, exercise 204. Let's go to JPEGs here. This is 204-5. And then we'll go ahead and click on save. Perfect. So now I have all of my images set. It's time to upload them to the course website. So I'm gonna follow along here on the course website. Oops, sorry, I already had it open there. Uh, let's create a new post. So I'll go up here to new. We're gonna create a new post. Let me open that in a new tab. Let's start by giving it a title here. This is exercise 204. All right. And I want to add some media. So I'll click on the add media link here. And I'm going to click on create a gallery. And I'm going to upload files to that gallery. So let me select my files here. And let me go to today. Oops, wrong one. And let's take those and we'll go ahead and click on open. And 
It's going to go through and upload all five of those images. And then I'm going to click on this create a new gallery. It allows me to edit the gallery, change the order, etc. All of those are fine. We'll go ahead and just insert the gallery. Perfect. There it is. I can also over here under format, change the format to be gallery, which allows me to turn on a slideshow for my post page, which is always nice. I still don't have a featured image, so I can't post it yet. So let me scroll all the way to the very bottom. I'll click on set featured image and I'll pick one of those images that I just uploaded. Let's pick this one and I'll set that as my featured image. When I scroll back up here, you can see that I'm able to publish, but before I do that under categories, I want to make sure that I choose this as exercise 204. And then I'll go ahead and click on publish. Perfect. So now that that's been published, let's go ahead and view the post and make sure it turned out the way I wanted it to. There it is. Here's my slideshow where I can easily scroll through those images. I also have my images in kind of small format here at the bottom. So that's perfect. I now have my post made and I'm done with exercise 204. So there are specific instructions for how that works. You can see them all there. And with that, I'll let you get to work.